Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second Emerging Growth Conference. I'm Anna Berry, and I'm going to be your host all day today. So if you happen to miss the first conference, do not worry at all. We have an exciting list of companies and a wide range of growth sectors presenting to you today. So our last conference and all conferences to come will be uploaded to the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe. Now, each company today will present for 30 minutes, and during that time, you, the attendees, can submit questions through the webinar module. The presenters may attempt to address as many of these as possible throughout or at the end of the presentation. Today, we have 10 exciting companies presenting. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first. Today, starting, we have Crown Elec Electrokinetics Corp. They trade on the NASDAQ under the symbol CRKN and is a leading smart glass technology company that has developed and is commercializing patented thin film solutions. It's also the creator of Dynamic Tent, quote, we make your glass smarter, unquote. Welcoming Doug Croxel, Crown CEO, is with us today. Doug, welcome. Thank you, Anna. Wonderful. We'll take it away whenever you're ready, Doug. Sure. Thank you. So uh, Crown is, uh, we're not really a smart glass company. We're a smart film company. Uh, we've developed and commercialized a pigment-based thin film, which we call Dynamic Tint. Um, the patented electrokinetic technology transitions between clear and dark in a matter of seconds. And because we're film and not glass, our film can be applied to not only uh, brand new glass that's being manufactured, but also, and more importantly, the glass that already exists in cars, homes, and buildings everywhere. Um, that provides, obviously, an incredibly large addressable market, um, which, which we intend to talk about later in the presentation. Our film um, has uh, performance uh, advantages over some of the alternative technologies that you may have heard of recently. Um, our film is affordable. Because it's film, it's much cheaper to make. It's much cheaper bill of materials than glass. Um, our transition speed is a matter of seconds. Uh, we have what we call a, a neutral color, color neutral, meaning that when you look through the film, what's on the other side of the film is exactly what God intended you to see. There's no additional color or hue in the film like there are in other smart glass technologies. And we are uh, incredibly low energy. We're low voltage, low wattage, which means with the solar strip that is embedded in our film, we can power the transition between clear and dark without requiring a homeowner, a building owner, to hardwire uh, their window to their electrical system. Um, our technology is supported by a very strong intellectual property portfolio. The patents and applications that we have were acquired from uh, Hewlett Packard uh, about, a, about a month ago, actually, when we closed our uplisting and our capital raise. We have a slightly different business model. Instead of um, raising $100 million and building our own factory and building our own equipment, um, we have partnered with existing thin film, film manufacturers, and we intend to utilize those relationships, the, the ex expertise and the equipment that they already have to develop and build our, our film for us. And uh, more importantly, our film helps building save energy. Um, in doing so, we help them achieve their net zero carbon goals much sooner. And um, we've had a lot, a lot of great discussions that I'm going to talk about later in this discussion, later in this presentation. So from a timeline perspective, oops, um, Hewlett Packard actually started the invention uh, in 2007. Um, the team that conceived of this idea stayed together. And in 2015, after HP had invested about $30 million of capital. They built a functional R&D lab, um, obviously developed a strong intellectual property portfolio. That was pulled away from HP, it was a spin out. Um, um, from 2015 to 2017, we really worked on developing the technology and it got to a point where we were able to enter into two joint development agreements, one with the largest glass manufacturer in the world and one with one of the largest thin film manufacturers in the world really primarily focusing on developing our technology for the automotive and transportation markets. About three, about two and a half years later, um, we took the technology 
to a large uh, a REIT, actually West Coast based REIT named Hudson Pacific Properties. Um, that REIT looked at our technology and immediately decided that they wanted to use our technology to put on all of the external windows of their office buildings. They were actually looking at another electrochromic uh, company and decided to go with our solution. Um, about six months later, they made an investment in Crown. About five, six months after that, um, we actually announced our first product, which I'm gonna demonstrate for you in a second. Um, this past January, literally a month and a half ago, uh, we uplisted from the OTC to NASDAQ. We raised uh, $21 million of new uh, capital. And this year we are focused on getting our technology from the lab uh, and commercialized into uh, buildings and homes everywhere. So our product, what is electrokinetic technology? Said simply, if you look down in the lower left quadrant, this is, a, this is an image um, of our film. And you can see here that the top and bottom layer are called clear plastic substrate. That's a really, that's called polyethylene. It's, it's thin, it's transparent, it's abundant, it's very inexpensive. Then we layer in what we call in, uh, two layers of indium tin oxide. Those two layers are also transparent, but it's highly conductive, meaning we can create an electronic field within our film. And within that electronic field, we can stack nanoparticle size pigment. Um, when those spheres are stacked on each other, they're so small that the human eye can't see it. And when we reverse the polarity of the field, we repel the pigment out into an open area. And now the human eye can see the pigment. It's as, it's as simply as, uh, stated as the film works. That film, like I said, could be applied to an existing a window. Here we have it um, on uh, a skylight in a kitchen. And I would like to ask um, the people that are helping us to run the video for me, please. snaps into uh, the existing frame of a skylight. That frame um, allows the skylight to hold in place without utilizing any fasteners or any tools. We're able to actually allow the user to change the tinting utilizing a smart device. That same insert that, we're, that we've built for a residential skylight, we've expanded that and we're building those for commercial buildings. So we can take our insert into an office building, we can take a single pane window, add our insert to create a dual pane environment. The, the insert that we add has our film and that can be optimized to save the building up to 25 to 30% of their energy used in HVAC. Um, our film allows for a room to stay cooler longer or to stay warmer longer thereby eliminating the need to use the HVAC as much as you would without our insert. So our market right now are all the office buildings that are looking um, to get to net zero carbon, which is uh, a considerable number of buildings. So one of the advantages that Crown has, um, as I referenced earlier, is that we're, we make film, we don't make glass, we don't need in a large facility with expensive equipment. Um, frankly, this is our lab in Corvallis, Oregon. This is an example, a picture I should say of our R&D tool. And this is a picture of our production line. It's, it's cased in a clean room. We can actually produce our own film. Our strategy, however, is to partner with existing thin film manufacturers and leverage their expertise and their um, equipment to manufacture our film. Um, our film is easily produced. It's produced on what's called a roll-to-roll -roll line. So we can produce a, a lot of it in a short amount of time and frankly, keep our labor costs down to, to minimum. So we talk a lot about the retrofit market. This is a cross-section of what that insert looks like. Here's the compliant silicone edge. This is simply a piece of acrylic or plexiglass. It could be glass if, if the building owner desired to have glass instead of plexiglass. 
we put our film on this one surface. The, these panels or these inserts, <coughs> excuse me, communicate together through a mesh network, and then we integrate those into the building management system. And what that does is that gives the building owner or the tenant or the person in the office control over how the insert changes, how it shades. For example, the building owner can say, we want to optimize our inserts to save us as much energy and uh, electricity as possible. So we can, we can tell the inserts to transition as the sun tracks across the sky, blocking the light from entering the room, lowering the, the need to use your HVAC. Or we can put that control into the hands of the person in the office. If they want to black out their window um, at any time of the day, they'll have the ability to do it. If someone leaves their office um, and, we, and the system knows that they're not there, it can automatically black out for energy savings. We can do the same thing, exactly same thing, with the dual pane um, insulated glass unit. So this would be an example of a brand new dual pane window. We would put our film on uh, one of the surface. It would work exactly the same way, wirelessly, uh, powered by a solar strip, connected into the building management system. But again, while we're talking to glass companies about this, this is a few years away, this retrofit product we're rolling out as quickly as possible. I spoke about our intellectual property it was developed by HP. We have added to our patent portfolio and we will continue to do so. Um, but frankly, um, anyone who wants to make, use, or sell anything with electrokinetic technology um, would not be able to do it without permission from Crown. So there are other solutions that have been around for a while. Um, this is a comparison of other technologies. The, the top line is dynamic tint. Um, and we put a couple of headings up here that we think are important and that most in the industry kind of track. Um, the other technologies, electrochromic, there's a company called View Inc, which announced in November they were merging into a SPAC. Uh, they, they are being valued at, I think, $1.6 billion. Um, suspended polymer particles, this is SPD. It's a company called Research Frontiers. And then PDLC, which is a liquid crystal technology. If you looked at where we play from a retrofit market, none of these three technologies can truly be a retrofit. The reason being is that if you have an <clears throat> existing building with windows and you wanted to retrofit with electrochromic SPD or PDLC, you would have to remove your existing window and then replace that with the window from one of these companies with one of these technologies. The cost in doing so is just prohibitive. So our product, and, and we did not identify this market initially, we were initially going after the automotive market, and when we realized that there was a, a customer need, decided to kind of change strategy and approach the existing um, commercial building market. So from a retrofit standpoint, our inserts can be installed without any fasteners. We can do it over a weekend, and we can connect it to the, to the building management system in that same weekend. So from, from a, a market, addressable market, and what market would be available to us versus our competitors, we play alone right now in the retrofit market. From a power usage standpoint, you can see that we barely use a, a hundredth of a watt of, of electricity per meter squared. <clears throat> this allows us to power the transition of the film with a sustainable uh, 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 sun utilizing a, a solar strip. None of these other technologies can do that. They need to hardwire their system in order to get power to transition the film. Because we're pigment based, we can make our film any color. Right now, the market wants black. And the reason they want black is that none of the other technologies can do black. The, usually there's a, a blue or a gray or a purple hue to electrochromic and SPD. <clears throat> so, you know, because we're pigment based, we can, we can allow the building owner to select the exact color that they like. Um, I talked about the solar. And, and one of the things we do is we put a little battery pack um, to back up the solar in case the sun's not available for, um, I think, 10 days. Our transition time is, again, a matter of seconds. And importantly, we let in up to 70% of the light and or block 99% of the light. So we have a, a very wide array of the amount of light that we block and let in. So I mentioned VIEW, uh, and they're, they are, uh, like I said, they were going public with a SPAC. It's a Cantor Fitzgerald SPAC. We did a quick comparison 
between uh, the markets that we were approaching and the markets that they are approaching. Um, so, you know, as I talked about the retrofit, we, we also obviously can do new construction. So there are a number of companies that are looking at buying our inserts um, and including the insert at the time of construction. So they would buy a single pane window, build the building, put in the curtain wall, and then add our insert as the dual pane. It's a much cheaper approach than buying a uh, dual pane window from view. Funding to date, they have definitely outraised us. However, we're a CapEx light company. So we didn't, I don't know what we would do with $1.8 billion. We, we didn't need it, nor would we uh, want to raise it. Um, we have raised approximately $30 million. Again, our manufacturing process is completely different. They're making glass, expending a lot of carbon in doing so. We're making film on a roll-to-roll -roll machine. Um, our cost to our customer is approximately 30 feet, $30 a square foot. Their estimated cost per their SEC filings is about $85 a square foot, so we're considerably less. Again, we talked about the retrofit and the power source and the embodied carbon. And, you know, obviously they're in the market now. We expect to have our product in the market in 2021. Uh, our return on investment. So this is great. There's a lot of really cool technology that exists, but if you can't make your technology affordable, and if your technology doesn't provide a return on investment for your customer, then you're just going to be another cool technology, and you'll likely not uh, be able to make that jump and leap and become a great company. Um, we feel that we will be a great company, not only because we have great technology and great people, but because we provide a real return on invested capital for our for our customer. We took an, a, a kind of an average size building, about a 26 floor building, which is about 500,000 square feet. That a building of that size has about 2,600 windows. This is actually the building that our offices are in, in Los Angeles, California. The average window in, our, in the building that we're in is about five foot by five foot. Our insert would cost approximately $600 per window. So for this building, it's gonna cost the building owner about $1.6 million to buy and have us install the inserts in their building. They will, they will earn um, approximately a savings of a million dollars over 10 years, <clears throat> excuse me, and three and a half over, over 20 years. And the way they earn that savings is we lower the amount of energy required to run their HVAC because we're keeping their air conditioned rooms cooler longer and the heated rooms uh, heated longer. Um, and in addition, once you put our blind, our, I'm sorry, once you put our inserts in, you no longer need to keep and or buy <clears throat> new blinds. We ran, excuse me, we ran that same calculation on a dual pane uh, window and, um, you know, we save even more money because we're eliminating the need to buy our insert. But um, either way, it's a great return for buildings. We're getting a lot of traction with building owners and uh, we're excited to roll this product out. So just quickly, the benefits of dynamic tent. I talked about the affordability. The roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing approach allows us to do this with very little labor cost. Um, the, uh, the material set is inexpensive. It's polyethylene, indium, tin oxide, and then our uh, resin and pigment. Our low voltage allows us to be anywhere without uh, requiring hard wiring. The retrofit gives us a, a massive addressable market. I mean, the market size that we're looking at in existing buildings will take us years to handle before we even get to new construction. Talked about the transition speed and the, and the neutrality of our color. And frankly, this product is actually helping buildings achieve net zero carbon initiatives today, not in the future. We allow building owners to adopt this technology into their existing building uh, inventory and help them get to zero carbon uh, earlier than they would through uh, other technologies. So target market, again, there's about 5.6 million, million existing commercial buildings in the United States. So it's about 87 billion uh, square feet of rentable space. That's the market that we're going after. Um, our real estate partner that we have right now has approximately 110 uh, buildings in their portfolio. If you do the math, you know, one building was about 1.6 million. That's kind of a big building for their portfolio. But if you do the math, one partner, 
one REIT that's not that large of a REIT really moves the needle tremendously for this company. And they're already a strategic partner and an investor. Um, we do talk about the residential skylight market. We did launch our residential skylight insert and we, have, uh, we do have existing demand to build and sell that product and we'll continue down that path as well. And then finally, the, the regulatory, regulatory tailwinds that exist in the sustainability um, market are, are tremendous for us right now. Every building owner is dying to find anything that they can do to help their building become more sustainable and achieve a net zero carbon initiative as quickly as possible. I, we talked about sustainability. Uh, I think it's probably one of the largest trends, if not the largest trend that is hitting corporate, the corporate world today, at least for the customers that we're speaking to. You know, buildings spend a lot of energy and emit a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, so by some, by some admissions, it's, it is, uh, you know, if, uh, if you look, I think it's a 37% of total electricity is coming from commercial buildings. And by the way, even though people think about commercial buildings and office buildings having all the windows, there's a lot of industrial uh, buildings that we're talking to as well. So we're not only talking to REITs that own commercial buildings, but most REITs have diversified into other areas, multifamily high-rise, um, college dormitories, government buildings, and industrial complexes all have windows and all are interested in getting their buildings to net zero carbon as quickly as possible. So we are part of the sustainability solution. Um, we wanna help buildings upgrade to be more energy efficient. We wanna help the need to eliminate um, the manufacturing of dual pane glass, which burns a lot of carbon in the manufacturing process. And we wanna help reduce the HVAC um, usage by, by uh, utilizing our inserts in their, their buildings. So I mentioned that 2021 will be the year of commercialization for Crown. We're moving our technology from the R&D lab into the production. Um, we, we expect that we will have product out the door this calendar year, um, primarily focused on uh, the commercial building market and also the residential skylight market. We have a great leadership team. We announced last week that we added two additional uh, members to our team, uh, Ed Kovalik, who's serving as president and COO, Kai Sato, who's also serving as president and chief marketing officer, Tim Cook, who is our, our chief technology officer, led the charge at HP when they were developing this technology and has pulled his entire engineering and technology team out of HP and over into Crown, and Phil Anderson, who's our CFO and, and also on the call today. As good as our uh, leadership team is, we would be nowhere without uh, the men in the lab in Corvallis, the, the team here that you're looking at. Uh, they're amongst the smartest men that I've ever worked with. Um, they all uh, worked at HP on this project and have all graciously agreed to leave HP and come to Crown over the various years in order to continue the development of the technology at Crown. So from an investment highlight standpoint, we have a huge market. Um, I mean, it's not just the United States, obviously, it's, it's office buildings, there's commercial buildings around the globe. Um, and it's Although we certainly could approach the new construction, we're really, um, we're really working hard to get to the existing buildings. The technology that we have, it's just better than the other technologies. It's film-based, not glass-based. It's cheaper to make. It burns less carbon to manufacture. It transitions faster. It can be any color, including black, and it's color neutral in the clear state. None of the other technologies can make those claims. It's backed by a strong intellectual property portfolio that we will continue to grow. We have great partnerships on the manufacturing side and on uh, the, the, command, the demand and customer side. And we have a great team that has delivered results before and will deliver results at Crown. And with that, um, I will end the conversation and open it up to any questions we might have. Thank you so much, Doug. That's fascinating. Um, we do have a few questions. Talk to me a little bit about your ownership profile. Yeah, so we did uh, a capital raise in uh, Jan just January of this year. Prior to that, we only raised about $8 million of capital to build this. 
we got a leg up because we received about $30 million worth of equipment from HP when we carved this out of HP. So we didn't have um, the same needs, capital needs that startups would have. Um, after the capital raise in January, Phil, do you want to walk through shares outstanding and, and how you divide those into which bucket? Sure. Can everybody hear me? Here you can't see you. Okay. Yes, we well, can hear you. probably hearing is better than seeing, candidly. Uh, so we have 13.5 million common shares issued. So that's our primary share account. We have 10.5 million options, which are all employee stock options. All those stock options have uh, a cashless exercise provision. There are 4.6 million warrants outstanding, which were a component of the fundings the company did prior to uplisting to the NASDAQ. <clears throat> and as discussed on the 37 meetings that Doug and I did for our roadshow, this capital raise should be sufficient to fund the company's growth plans, i.e., that should be the last capital raise the company needs unless something extraordinary happens, but we're fully funded for our internal growth plan. And then if you're looking for financial guidance, I would point to you the research report that Roth Capital published uh, Monday, where they're looking for $13 million of revenue in fiscal year 2022. And I want to point out that our company has a March fiscal year end. So in effect, that's one year out. So $13 million of revenue going cash flow positive in the March quarter. So a year out cash flow positive. And then in fiscal 2023, Roth is looking for $65 million of revenue and $33 million of EBITDA. We're comfortable with these numbers. Well, adding on to that, Phil and Doug, um, so the question is, your market cap is, a, is it at about $60 million now? So based on the comps, it seems you're greatly undervalued. Has anyone tried to initiate a takeover or merger conversation with you? Uh, no. I mean, you know, we've only been public on the NASDAQ for a little over a month. Um, and to be honest, you know, I, I, I've come from a school of thought that um, venture capital firms have monopolized the growth and the value of that growth for too many years. So my preference is to get a company that typically would be in year four or five of a VC portfolio and get it out into the public market as quickly as possible and allow the shareholder to enjoy the growth, the value growth in the company as opposed to a venture capital firm. Um, so while we're only a $60 million market cap today, that's largely because we're just getting into the a commercialization segment of, of our life. So no, I mean, we've, we've had conversations in the past, definitely have had conversations in the past about selling the company. Um, I'm glad we didn't sell the company. Um, and frankly, you know, if someone made, if someone made an offer to buy the company and it was legitimate, you know, my fiduciary duty is to take it to the board of directors and the board as a body would decide you know what path was appropriate to take uh, but at this point we're very focused on continuing to build uh, the company continuing to develop and commercialize the technology uh, into one of the largest markets that exists which is the commercial building market perfect uh, in case i missed it what percentage of your business is commercial and what percentage is residential it'll largely you know because the commercial market is so large it will largely, the majority, vast majority, will likely be commercial buildings. I mean, just you know, just a single order. For what that one building example that I cited with 2,600 windows, um, you know, that that order uses film that would have we would have to have 5,800 skylight orders in order to equal one single building, and we're not. We're not addressing this pro this opportunity one building at a time. We're addressing this opportunity one portfolio of buildings at a time. When we talk to a, a building owner, they don't typically own one building. It's a REIT, and they own hundreds, if not thousands, of buildings. So, just the sheer size um, of the um, opportunity in the commercial building, and if you think about the amount of glass that exists on the outside of buildings, that's the market 
that we're going after. And clearly, you know, we like the residential market, but I think it'll probably pale um, in comparison to what we're going to do in the commercial building space. Okay. So as to capitalization, do you think you will need to do another raise in the future? If so, when, how much, and where will that money go? Uh, we, so the reason that we did the capital raise uh, in January was so we did not have to go back to the market and raise capital. I think one of the mistakes that um, micro cap companies make is they don't raise enough money when they have the opportunity to raise that capital. And you don't want to get in that cycle where you got money for a year and you know six months out, you got to start raising money again. The market, once you become a serial capital raiser in the market, investors are just waiting for that next S1 to be filed or that for that next shoe to drop, if you will. So we, we've raised enough capital that we do not have to go back out to the market. It doesn't mean that we won't, it means that we don't have to. Um, if we do go back out to the market to raise capital, it's because we're being opportunistic um, you know, with our, with our market cap or our share price. But at this point, we don't have plans. Um, and at this point, uh, you know, we frankly don't need to. Okay. Uh, last question. You mentioned a patent. How narrow is that? And are you saying that it's impossible for any major competition? So uh, it's not one patent. It's a uh, portfolio of patents. There's 10 patents that we have currently. There are seven applications that we have as well. Um, our technology is protected not only by the patents that we have, but by the trade secrets that we don't share um, with the patent office. So when we go through the invention process at Crown, we take a look at what we have and we make a decision. Uh, do we want to file for a patent to protect this invention or do we want to keep this invention secret and protect it as a trade secret? So Crown has a combination of both. So some of the things that we do, we, we obviously file patent protection on, and some of the things we do, we don't file anything on, we keep that as a secret. So what I'm telling you is that if anyone wants to legally make, use, or sell electrokinetic technology, they would need to get a, a license or permission from Crown. That does not mean that someone won't try to go out and counterfeit or uh, create the technology on their own. I will tell you that it is uh, difficult, not impossible, to reverse engineer technology. Pretty much everything can be reverse engineered if you throw enough money at it. Um, ours is probably no different, although I think it'd be very, very hard to reverse engineer our technology that is um, not covered by patents. Well, thank you. We do have a few more minutes. So Phil or Doug, if, if either of you would like to have some closing remarks about this before we end this, this slide, let me know. You're welcome to finish up here. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the time. I appreciate your help, Anna, in the process and everybody at Emerging Growth uh, Markets for allowing us to present. Um, I, I know that it is, uh, we're a relatively new technology and frankly, um, people struggle oftentimes with where this technology fits and, and how it works. I encourage you to go to our website. Um, we have a lot of videos there, a lot of ex explanation of how the technology works. And uh, this technology is ubiquitous. The cost uh, of our technology is the price point for our technology allows for market-wide adoption. When you look at Crown's technology and you compare it to other smart glass technologies, we're a fraction of the cost, which means we will seek and try to get uh, our solution as ubiquitous solution. The other technologies have been around for 10 years, 20 years. They're still a niche player at best. So I would look to our technology to be, to be the ubiquitous technology that wins the market. And um, I'll leave you with that thought. Phil, do you have anything? Yeah, so I'm basically a finance geek. I've been uh, run money for 17 years. So when I look at our business, we're fully funded. Uh, if you were a shrewd analyst of our public company filings, you might conclude that our SG&A is 500 or $600,000 a month. Uh, we anticipate outsourcing the manufacturing. Consequently, there'll be little uh, CapEx. Uh, if you look at the Roth report, you would see we have a, a I'm looking right now, of 60% gross profit margin. And we should scale from there, meaning that we're not investing, we're not reinvesting the cash flow that we harvest back into the business. 
We're simply going to put that cash flow back on the balance sheet until Doug finds us something to buy. Uh, so you have essentially a fully funded, very low CapEx model with a fully patented portfolio with something that I think, I know my wife wants to be first in line to get this in our house, and I think we take over the Western world. All right, well, this was a fantastic presentation. Thank you gentlemen so much. We look forward to following up with all of your updates in the future. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you Anna. so much. Thanks everybody.